All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome, everyone here in the room, and to those of us, uh, those of you watching the webcast uh, online. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Kinchi Lau. My name is Peter Beatty. I am an assistant professor at the Masters of Global Political Economy program at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, our program was started after the Great Financial Crisis, or the GFC, and it was formed explicitly uh, to offer an education to help future leaders and citizens to avoid similar catastrophes. Uh, so here I'm not talking about the relatively well-known or much-discussed causes of the GFC, things like financialization, uh, deregulation or feckless regulation, uh, derivatives or weapons of mass financial destruction. I'm talking about the intellectual causes. So the intellectual rot that allowed global leaders in government, academia, and business to believe that the market, you know, blessings be upon it, the market is uh, self-regulating and that uh, self-interest and the invisible hand would protect us all from danger. Uh, I'm talking about economic orthodoxy, a mainstream neoclassical economics, which sadly to a large extent has more in common with dogma than the science. Uh, as David Graeber wrote in his review of Robert Sadelsky's latest book, quote, mainstream economists nowadays might not be particularly good at predicting financial crashes, facilitating general prosperity, or coming up with models for preventing climate change, but when it comes to establishing themselves in positions of intellectual authority, unaffected by such failings, their success is unparalleled one would have to look at the history of religions to find anything like it, unquote. So CUHK's Master of Global Political, Political Economy program was instituted to provide a greater diversity of perspectives to help the next generation to avoid being suckered by the conventional wisdom, and hence to avoid future such catastrophes, like uh, most pressingly the impending climate catastrophe. I hope everyone can foster within themselves a bit of a contrarian or critical streak following Mark Twain's advice, which was, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. Given all of this, I can't think of a better speaker to be introducing to MGPE students and netizens all over the world than Professor Michael Hudson. It was Michael Hudson's uh, article in Harper's Magazine in 2006 that warned me about the state of the housing market in the US so that when the GFC finally hit, I was unsurprised. Uh, Michael has long been a critical scholar and a bit of a contrarian whose intellectual track record looks a lot better than his mainstream counterparts. Uh, this actually reminds me of a great scene in the movie The Big Short where an angry investor in a uh, fund that has bet all of its money shorting the US housing market asks the manager, do you think, are you saying that you know better than Alan Greenspan? Uh, to which the response was, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what I'm saying. So Mike Burry, who gets his hair cut at Supercuts and doesn't wear shoes, knows more than Alan Greenspan. Dr. Mike Burry, yes, he does. <laughs> I was in the early 2000s. Uh, I was in law school in New York, and I naively thought that law and jurisprudence were the commanding heights of how the law, how the world worked. Uh, but after being introduced to the school of legal realism, I realized that real power couldn't be located in formal law, but in political economy. So I found Henry's writings, and he introduced me to Professor Hudson. So I first read uh, this book, Super Imperialism, and then Global Fracture, which formed the, uh, the main stay of the talk that Michael's giving today, also updating uh, on dollar hegemony and how it can be superseded and replaced. Uh, and then I moved on to other books like The Bubble and Beyond, uh, Killing the Host, both of which cover how uh, in today's world, in much of the world, finance has taken on a parasitic and economically destructive role. Uh, then his book, uh, Trade, Development, and Foreign Debt, is a fascinating work of intellectual history on theories of uh, international trade and investment. And then lastly, just to, to note one more example, uh, America's protectionist takeoff uh, is an excavation of the forgotten American school of political economy and 19th century debates over pauper labor uh, and the economy of high wages doctrine, which although it's covering debates that are a century and a half old, I think is uh, very relevant today, and I would say particularly relevant uh, for China today. Uh, well, 
With no further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to join me in uh, welcoming Michael Hudson. Well, I feel very honored to be here, and uh, I'm grateful to Peter and also to Kim Chi Lau for uh, having such an illustrious audience. Uh, since the talk is about the ending of American uh, hegemony, I have to begin by describing uh, what it is. And the basic theme of my talk is that the precondition for any country looking uh, for global dominance or to create an empire is the balance of payments uh, and the ability to uh, uh, dominate and control the world's monetary system. Because ultimately, money is uh, even more of a lever than a military uh, force, as we're seeing today. Uh, if you can control the monetary system, uh, you can get other countries into debt to yourself. And if you can get them into debt, then you can treat them like the International Monetary Fund uh, and the European Central Bank treat Greece or Latin America or Argentina or uh, the Ukraine or uh, Russia. If it likes you, like the Ukraine, uh, no matter what form of government you have, it will call you a democracy and give you all the money you want. If you seek to become independent of American control, if you do not sell your natural resources to the United States, then uh, you will be uh, denied of the financial uh, basics that you need to create your own money supply and to fund your own economic growth. So American hegemony enables the United States to stop any other country from gr go, uh, growing by pulling out the connections of its financial system, just like it did uh, in the case of uh, the Soviet Union after 1991. Uh, dollarization is the ability of the United States to run balance of payments deficits without any limit at all. Uh, and since 1951, the United States balance of payments has been continually in deficit. Any other country, if you run a deficit, would have to raise its interest rates, impose austerity, and uh, stop its economic growth. The United States has not had to do that, largely because uh, the rest of the world needs, or believes that it needs, uh, the U.S. dollar. So the amount of U.S. dollars, which are U.S. Treasury obligations, their debt, the international monetary reserves of the world's central banks are the debts of the United States government. Imagine if you could, whenever you went to the store, if you could simply write an IOU uh, and get the groceries you needed, pay the rent you wanted, uh, buy whatever you wanted, and uh, other people would hold the IOUs, and they would use that to think that they're wealthy. They could trade them with each other and everyone would accept them, but you'd never have to pay them off. You'll just write an IOU. That's essentially what the United States is able to do uh, internationally. And the result is that uh, the amount of U.S. government debt in international reserves is 30 times the amount of, the Japan, of uh, China's RMB and three times uh, the amount of euros. So the United States uh, can run a trade deficit and a military deficit and just spend money into uh, foreign countries. Uh, other countries, uh, you know what happens to them if they run a deficit. They have to go to the International Monetary Fund, which is a small office in the, base of, in the basement of the U.S. Pentagon. And uh, the International Monetary Fund will tell people, you'll have to sell your raw materials to United States and other investors. You'll have to buy your uh, food and agricultural uh, uh, crops from the United States, not grow them yourselves, you will have to become dependent or else we will, uh, do the, we will make you look like we made Cuba or Iran or Venezuela look like. We will uh, make you an outcast of the world monetary system. So basically, it's your money or your life. That is uh, the deal that's being made. Why doesn't this happen to the United States? And the answer is that uh, the, the dollar's uh, unique status. Here's what happens. The United States will begin spending money on its 800 military bases around the world. 
and it will uh, import uh, manufactured goods from China and other countries that it no longer produces. When it spends these dollars, uh, the dollars uh, are received by uh, Korea, uh, uh, other countries, uh, and uh, they, the recipients take the dollars and they turn them into domestic currency because that's what other countries use, and uh, they get the domestic currency from their central bank. So they turn the dollars over to the central bank that now ends up with these dollars. Well, what does the central bank do with it? Uh, until 1971, they would buy gold. Uh, and if they would buy gold, the U.S. would have less of them. Uh, but now uh, the uh, foreign central banks don't buy gold. They don't buy stocks uh, or private sector bonds. They really don't have much of a choice uh, to do anything except buy U.S. Treasury bonds. So they, uh, when they buy U.S. Treasury bonds with them, uh, they send the money back to the United States it is recycled uh, back into the U.S. government. So the U.S. government spends on military account. This gets into foreign economies. Their central banks turn them back in. And uh, that is uh, what has created the whole uh, Western world into a dollar area. Uh, everybody using uh, the dollars. And for foreign central banks, uh, Russia, uh, other countries, uh, even China for a while, uh, these uh, dollars in their reserves enabled them to uh, expand their economy, to spend abroad, uh, and continually uh, grow. Uh, what is unique is that the larger the United States balance of payments deficit becomes, the more dollars are spent abroad and recycled to fund the, U the domestic budget deficit. So the government doesn't have to borrow from the United States, uh, citizens uh, and investors. It doesn't have to print the money. It gets uh, the money to fund its uh, military spending, which is the main factor behind the budget deficit, uh, from other countries. So other countries are actually paying for these 800 military bases and uh, are paying for the U.S. encirclement of them, which uh, the U.S. will use in case other countries seek to misbehave and withdraw uh, from the dollar area. So. This is uh, essentially a way of making uh, other countries pay for U.S. Uh, policy. And uh, what does uh, U.S. policy want? Uh, it, it can then go to other countries and say, we want you to follow our neoliberal policy. And the policy is privatization. They have to sell off their public domain, their public infrastructure, their electric utilities, their raw materials, their oil. Uh, to uh, American buyers, and the hope is that uh, when foreigners buy a U.S. Treasury bond, uh, they get less than 1% interest. But when Americans buy foreign, uh, private investors, buy foreign industry, the idea is they can make at least uh, 25% uh, percent, uh, per year. Uh, I did a study of the balance of payments of the oil industry in 1965, and every dollar uh, in, uh, invested in foreign oil in balance of payments terms was recovered within 18 months. So uh, you have a, one year, you recover all the money and it's a constant doubling time. The plan of the United States in, at that time in the 1960s and the argument put before uh, the oil industry to Congress, uh, which I actually was hired to write, was uh, if we can uh, make so big a profit on other countries, pretty soon we will get so much investment from them that we can afford to spend our uh, money abroad and uh, maintain our military uh, control of them so that nobody would dare withdraw from the system. So that's basically the system we have today. And it's counterintuitive. It's not fair, and uh, you won't find it in economics textbooks because economic textbooks say uh, how Everything that exists is inevitable and the result of equilibrium and uh, the best of all possible worlds, otherwise we'd have a different world. Well, it's not inevitable, and I'm going to spend the rest of this talk explaining how we got here uh, to this situation so you know how to get out of it uh, if indeed you want to. The larger the United States balance of payments deficit becomes, the more dollars are spent abroad and recycled to fund the you, the domestic budget deficit. 
So the government doesn't have to borrow from the United States, uh, citizens uh, and investors. It doesn't have to print the money. It gets uh, the money to fund its uh, military spending, which is the main factor behind the budget deficit, uh, from other countries. So other countries are actually paying for these 800 military bases and uh, are paying for the U.S. encirclement of them, which uh, the U.S. will use in case other countries seek to misbehave and withdraw uh, from the dollar area. And I'm going to spend the rest of this talk explaining how we got here uh, to this situation so you know how to get out of it uh, if indeed you want to. Basically, problem began in World War I and intensified in World War II. Uh, World War I was basically a fight between uh, a finance capital countries, uh, Britain and France, uh, arming uh, to prevent what they thought was a threat, and that was a threat of uh, st socialism, specifically state socialism of Germany and Central Europe. Uh, what made uh, Germany and Central Europe different from uh, England, the United States, and, uh, and France was that uh, there was a unity between the government uh, heavy industry, ba uh, very largely based on uh, armaments and uh, building ships and a uh, navy, uh, and banking. And uh, the difference uh, between German banking and Central European banking and English banking was the difference between short term and long term. Uh, the government representatives and the bankers would get together with the industry and say, how much credit uh, do you need to, uh, to grow? When German banks would invest in a company, they, uh, unlike the British uh, banks, they would not ask all, all your dividends should be paid out quickly. They'd say, don't uh, pay out the dividends to investors. We don't want the dividends. We want your uh, company to grow and to take our gain in the form of capital accumulation. Uh, by contrast, uh, in 1914, uh, the British financial press uh, began to publish uh, warnings saying they, they feared England would lose the war to Germany because of financing. Uh, its banks wanted quick payouts, uh, the stock market was hit and run, uh, it was basically uh, rife with fraud, and uh, the uh, stock market uh, people would put investors into a uh, a company and then just sort of leave it there. There was no long-term growth and no uh, work between government and finance and industry together. That was what they called the free market. Germany realized uh, that uh, to develop, it had to do just what the United States did and what I described in America's protectionist payoff. You need the government to invest in basic infrastructure uh, to lower the cost of doing business. That if uh, the government would run uh, your transportation system, your telephone system, your communication system, uh, it could provide services at cost or at a subsidized basis or freely, uh, public health, uh, health care, uh, medicine, uh, all of this was viewed as a capitalist policy. At that time, people thought that industrial capitalism was going to evolve into socialism of one form or another. There were many kinds of socialism. There was state socialism in uh, uh, Germany run by the heavy industry. Uh, there was uh, anarchic socialism. There was Marxian socialism. There was uh, the old fashioned uh, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill uh, land tax uh, socialism to uh, free capitalism from uh, the landlord class. Uh, everybody before World War I believed that the tendency in every country was for government to play a larger role. And uh, they, the general word for this uh, was socialism. And uh, the main supporters were capitalists because the capitalists wanted the government to subsidize their development to lower the cost of doing business, lower the cost of living, and if the government would provide medical care, a healthy population, uh, then uh, the employers could pay uh, their uh, l workforce less because they wouldn't have to pay uh, for the work, for, uh, the labor force, uh, paying all these higher costs. Well, uh, it seemed to be uh, that uh, Germany uh, as an economic system was uh, destined to dominate the Anglo-American countries. And uh, what that meant was 
there was a struggle between two different kinds of capitalism, uh, between industrial capitalism of the German model and the finance capitalism of the Anglo-American model. Uh, what changed matters, of course, was that the United States uh, entered the war on the side of England, largely because uh, the American uh, uh, financial system had changed away from industrialization towards uh, the British uh, uh, system. And the day just before America entered the war, J.P. Morgan uh, went to the White House and convinced uh, 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 the President uh, Wilson that indeed we had to, uh, we had lent so much money uh, to England to buy armaments. Uh, if we were going to collect uh, the money that England owed us, uh, that we sold them on credit, we would have to go to war and make sure that it won so it would have enough money to pay the American uh, arms exporters. Uh, I go over the story in great detail on super-imperialism. Uh, America did indeed come in uh, to destroy uh, Germany, and the problems all began when the peace uh, occurred. The question was, what were the terms of peace? And America did something that was very different from European experience. When England went to war against Napoleon uh, with its allies, when it had uh, gone to war with other countries, European countries, once the war was over, the winners would typically uh, forgive the uh, debts of uh, the support that they'd given each other. And the English imagined that somehow the Americans were going to act like 18th century and uh, Englishmen would have acted and said, okay, uh, we've won, we're all on the same side. Uh, you don't have to pay us uh, for all of the arms uh, that we sold you uh, before we entered the war. Uh, America did agree not to make England pay for the uh, rifles and the bullets and the airplanes uh, that it so, uh, contributed during the war, but before America entered the war, uh, France, England, and the, the Allies had uh, borrow, uh, borrowed a huge amount of money from the Americans to, uh, uh, to buy the arms to fight Germany. Well, the inter-Allied debts were so large so uh, they were beyond the ability of Germany to pay, of England to pay without going bankrupt, as it did any, in any case uh, by 1926 when you had the great uh, general strike in England. Germany uh, uh, was obliged to pay uh, England and France so much money uh, that uh, they could turn around and pay the Americans. And John Maynard Keynes wrote a number of wonderful essays on uh, uh, the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles is an economic disaster, saying there is no way these debts can be paid. The Allies, uh, because of the American insistence on being paid for the World War I debts, they are going to have to insist on huge German reparations. Uh, they, uh, the reparations included taking away uh, the uh, most productive, economically uh, profitable uh, German uh, lands uh, bordering France, uh, taking uh, Germany's monetary reserves, driving it so bankrupt that you had the, the hyperinflation of uh, the 1920s, uh, you had the collapse of the Reichmark, you had the conditions that ended up producing Nazism and uh, that led uh, to World War II. Well, uh, by 1931, after the Depression of 1929, uh, it was obvious that, other con that the whole world was being torn apart by uh, the American government's demands on European governments uh, to Im impose austerity and pay them. And uh, so they suspended the inter-Allied debts and uh, they suspended uh, German reparations, uh, although the United States says we're keeping these debts on the books in case we ever want, you ever do get money, we're going to want whatever uh, you have. So the result is that uh, Germany uh, ended up with Nazism. Once again, England and France realized uh, there was a fear of German growth. The result was another war between England, France, and, and Germany with America uh, joining in. And uh, this time, uh, the American strategy against England was uh, very different from what it was in World War I. Uh, President Roosevelt uh, and his uh, cabinet did not like England very much. They thought, we, we can use World War II as an opportunity to break up the British Empire, and we can pick up the pieces. 
And uh, by uh, making uh, England indebted to us again, as we did in World War I, we can make it uh, settle the debts by uh, breaking up the empire and following an American-centered world, this time with free trade now that we have all the gold. Well, by the time uh, World War II ended in 1945, America had uh, not only half of the world's monetary gold, that is the gold in central banks, but it had the largest industrial capacity in the world because it had been built up all this industrial capacity during the war to provide uh, the arms uh, uh, to fight Germany. By 1950, American trade surplus and domination had grown so much that it had accumulated about 75%, three quarters of the world's monetary gold. Uh, the rest of the world, Europe, Asia, Latin America, were all put uh, sort of on ra rations and they were uh, being uh, stifled in their growth while the United States was taking off. Uh, then uh, a great change happened, uh, an about face. For the first time, uh, the, uh, in 1950-51, the United States balance of payments went into deficit because of the Vietnam, uh, because of the Korean War. Uh, and the Korean War uh, was uh, so expensive that uh, it started what would last for three decades, where the entire U.S. balance of payments deficit uh, was military in character. Uh, in the superimperialism, I have a chart, and I show the private sector was just exactly in balance in the 1950s, the 1960s, and onward. The entire deficit was uh, military uh, in character. Uh, this became even more serious uh, after 1962 uh, in the Vietnam War. Uh, what happened was uh, after Roosevelt uh, died, after being reelected for his fourth term, uh, the, uh, the, uh, he was replaced, he'd chosen or was forced to choose by the Southerners who controlled the Democratic Party in the United States uh, to appoint uh, Harry Truman as president. Truman uh, uh, immediately uh, threw his support uh, behind uh, the British Empire and the French Empire. And uh, when uh, Eisenhower was elected in 1952, uh, Eisenhower uh, decided to put all of America's support behind the French Empire, uh, including uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, saying that any country that wanted control of its raw materials, any country that was nationalistic and wanted to control its own growth was communist. Well, if that was true, of course, everybody would want to be communist at that time. But uh, they confused a nationalist revolution uh, in uh, Vietnam and uh, other countries with a uh, communist uh, revolution and began uh, the backing that in the 1960s under President Kennedy and even more Johnson uh, became uh, the enormous uh, balance of payments outflow during the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, Every American soldier in Vietnam used one ton of copper per year. The American strategy was if you can fill all of the air full of bullets uh, continually, there won't be anyone surviving uh, to fight you. Uh, and it was as if they were fighting each other with ingots. Well, uh, the costs of fighting the Vietnam War include making military bases over the world, spending money, especially spending money in Indochina, not only in uh, Vietnam, but in Laos. And uh, being French, the, uh, there were no, the, all the banks uh, were French, and the money that was spent locally in dollars were taken by the uh, Vietnamese uh, central bank, the Laotian, Cambodian central banks, and sent to Paris because they were part of the Franc area. And uh, General de Gaulle would then uh, very conspicuously every month uh, say, we've got so many dollars, please give us gold for these. En vérité, on ne voit pas qu'il puisse y avoir réellement de critères, d'étalons 
autre que l'or. Uh, uh, at the time, I was Chase Manhattan Bank's balance of payments economist uh, during the mid-60s. And every Friday, we would wait for the Federal Reserve's uh, report that came out on U.S. gold holdings. And at that time, every uh, printed dollar bill or $10 bill or current printed currency in your pocket had to be backed 25% by gold. And so we looked at the currency, uh, pretty steady, and we looked at the gold supply dropping and dropping and dropping each month, not only from General de Gaulle with his nice speeches, but uh, Germany that cashed in uh, the gold without uh, making the speeches. And we, it was obvious to us that the uh, United States uh, was going to go off gold. Surprisingly enough, uh, to many of you, it was Wall Street that opposed the Vietnam War for that reason. Uh, when I joined uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, George Champion was the uh, uh, chief executive officer of it, and uh, he was against the. He said, uh, "America's war in Vietnam is not fiscally responsible." It was pushing the country into budget deficit and balance of payments deficit. Uh, most of Wall Street was against the war. The people, uh, the Vietnam War, and the military policy of America today is largely by the left. The labor unions supported the war. The labor unions would have their members, uh, when there were anti-war parades, the labor unions would try to break them up. Uh, the labor union leaders came out in favor of the war, saying, we need uh, the employment by the arms. Why are you here today? We're in support of Nixon. Apparently, you don't agree with the purpose of this demonstration. No, I don't. I don't support President Nixon, and I don't support the war. Do you anticipate any trouble here today? No, I don't think so. Do you think American forces should be withdrawn from Vietnam? Yes, I do. I don't think we should have ever been there in the first place. I'm against Nixon. I'm against just about everything he stands for. I think that I have two brothers. He's not speaking for the construction workers. He's, a, he's, he's all by himself. I'm what do the construction workers say? We say that we support our flag. We support our government. We support what they're doing over there. We're supporting our working men, and we're not back of this guy at all. He's one of them, but he has his way. He's an individual. Let me tell you something. He's down here with that sign, not here representing us construction people. We represent that flag. Uh, the, the labor unions moved, as they are today, to the far right wing of the political spectrum. Wall Street moved to the relative left wing of the political spectrum and remained there uh, for a decade. Well, finally, uh, the, uh, the time came by uh, 1971 when uh, America ran out of gold. And uh, it, it said, we're not going to sell any more gold at $35 uh, uh, an ounce. Uh, they closed the L London gold pool where they'd been doing all of the selling and uh, went off gold. And that created a lot of worry in the government because if, uh, imagine for ever since World War I, America had dominated the world by having most of the gold. It had the gold, and therefore the monetary base and other countries didn't have it. It thought, now what's going to happen? Uh, there were uh, forecasts of it uh, running a balance of payments deficit, and it said the dollar is going to go down and down. There's going to be hyperinflation. Uh, uh, we've lost it. Uh, I didn't think that would happen, and uh, I, with, I wrote my book, Super Imperialism, to show that uh, what, without getting gold, what were central banks going to do with all of these dollars that were being pumped into the world monetary system? Well, I said they only have one choice. They're not going to buy U.S. stocks. They're not going to buy U.S. companies. They're not going to buy real estate. Uh, they're going to buy treasury bonds. And uh, they, uh, instead of the gold standard, we now have a U.S. treasury bond standard. Uh, and I gave a speech at uh, uh, Drexel Burnham for, uh, for their annual meeting saying this. And uh, uh, Herman Kahn, uh, who was a military strategist, you may know him from the movie Dr. Strangelove that was based on him, immediately hired me. and. Uh, told me that uh, the largest uh, purchaser of the book, uh, Super Imperialism, 2,000 copies, was the Defense Department and the CIA. And they looked at it as a how-to-do-it book. Uh, I had thought that socialists would read it, but the socialists wanted to say, America's weak, America's weak, we won, it's ended the war. Much to my surprise, I thought, somehow some other country is going to do something about this. Uh, 
uh, it was translated into Spanish, and uh, I know the Russians were uh, uh, translate uh, were working on it. But uh, what happened what was that uh, all of a sudden the world became more dependent on U.S. government debt than they had become dependent on gold. Well, now uh, you can fast forward. This is in 1971 and two. Well, in 1973 and four, you had uh, what's called the oil war. It really wasn't the oil war. It was the uh, uh, grain war. The Carter administration and the U.S. administration wanted, said the butter, we looked at the trade figures of the United States and the basis of America's foreign trade, uh, the strongest sector is agriculture. That's outperformed industry, outperformed absolutely everything. And uh, they quadrupled the price of gold. And then uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and the OPEC countries retaliated by quadrupling the price of oil. So uh, they, uh, the United States wondered what to do. Uh, I was brought down to the State Department and the U.S. Treasury and met with uh, the uh, heads of Sta Standard Oil who had joined the Treasury as their uh, officials, which is appropriate because oil is the balance of payments and, and the Treasury, and that was my old friend. And he said, we've made a deal with uh, Saudi Arabia. You can charge whatever you want for your oil, but you have to take all of your trade surplus and you have to reinvest it in the United States economy. We won't let you buy any American company because uh, you're Arabs and we're not. But you can buy a million shares of every country on the Dow Jones average. You can get minority shares and the rest you'll buy treasury bills. And Saudi Arabia uh, agreed and as they have ever since. In 1978, you had the Iranian revolution. And uh, here is an example of how dollar uh, hegemony uh, was used to dominate other countries. Iran, under the Shah, like other countries, uh, had borrowed and denominated its debt in dollars. America's debt is all owed in dollars. So America, as uh, Alan Greenspan said, can always repay its debts because it can just print the dollars. But if you're a foreign country, if you're Turkey or China, or Hong Kong or Korea, you can't print dollars to pay your dollar-denominated debt. Now, uh, Iran held dollar reserves, U.S. Treasury bill, bonds and bank accounts, so that it could pay the interest on the foreign debts that it had borrowed before. And uh, so in uh, 1978, it sent a note to Chase Manhattan, where I'd worked, saying, please, uh, please pay out of our account uh, the follow, uh, what we owe the bondholders changed uh, CEOs to David Rockefeller. And David Rockefeller wanted to do what he thought was right, which he defined as doing what the Treasury told him to do. Uh, by, uh, Chase Manhattan is very different from Citibank at that time. Uh, Citibank was always trying to make money for itself. David Rockefeller was uh, essentially uh, had thought of becoming Treasury Secretary, but wanted to do what uh, the government told him to do, thinking that was good citizenship. And so he said, okay, uh, we're not going to uh, pay the money out of the, uh, uh, Mr. Khomeini's account now that uh, uh, we don't like Khomeini, we like the Shah. And that forced Iran, Iran to default on the debt. And on the terms of the borrowing under the Shah is if you miss a payment, you owe the entire principal. Imagine if you took out a mortgage and uh, you could pay a little bit every month, but if you miss a month, you have to pay the entire balance. Well, uh, obviously Iran couldn't, and uh, uh, that became the excuse that the United States took to isolate uh, Iran and the world markets. A similar thing happened in 1985 with Japan. Americans uh, became very uh, worried about uh, all of the automobiles that Japan uh, was making and the electronics and the other things. So it asked uh, uh, Japan to please commit suicide. Well, Japan was quite happy to do this because after World War II, uh, when uh, MacArthur came in, it said, we have two choices. Uh, there's a large socialist movement in Japan. They're you know, very good when they uh, fight the police, they have helmets on. Uh, but we have one great ally, the criminal class, the Yakuza's. America put all of its backing behind the criminal class, hired them to assassinate uh, the socialists, uh, as it does in other countries, uh, and uh, essentially uh, put them in power so that they were willing to do almost everything uh, the United States uh, wanted them to do. Uh, and uh, they uh, agreed to uh, raise the price of the yen against the dollar 
so much. Their uh, car industry went bankrupt in uh, 1990. They were completely wrecked as they remain wrecked today. Uh, so uh, if you're a friend of the United States, you are expected to take one for the team and kill yourself, kill your economy to help the United States. That's what it means to be a democracy uh, in today's world. Uh, well, then finally you had 1991 uh, with the, uh, the final stage of Stalinism being kleptocracy and neoliberalism, the United States sent uh, uh, the Americans over to help make sure that uh, Yeltsin won. And uh, as uh, President Putin noted, uh, Russia lost as a result of the neoliberal uh, that was brought there in 1991, it lost 22 million people, more than it lost in World War II as a result of neoliberal policies. And the, uh, basic, uh, basically what had happened in 1980, uh, every trend in the world economy made an about face, turned around and the result was Margaret Thatcher in England and Ronald Reagan in the United States introducing uh, neoliberalism, meaning essentially finance capitalism, uh, not uh, industrial capitalism. Uh, and that uh, absolutely uh, transformed uh, matters. And uh, the, it's obvious that at that point, the world was put on a kind of uh, a collision course. Now, the problem uh, for the for the world uh, today that this uh, after the uh, 1997 Asia crisis that uh, you all had to experience here when your real estate prices collapsed and uh, the collapse was uh, especially bad in uh, North Korea. Uh, where uh, the Americans uh, used the Asia crisis that was connected to the ruble collapse as a means of coming in and buying control by buying the stocks of uh, Korean and uh, uh, other uh, uh, Jap uh, uh, Chinese uh, and other companies at uh, a great discount. Uh, it was engineered really in the United States. Uh, the question is, what do other countries do to, uh, to stop this uh, uh, neoliberal policy that is destroying their economies. Basically what had happened in 1980, uh, every trend in the world economy made an about face, turned around and the result was Margaret Thatcher in England and Ronald Reagan in the United States introducing uh, neoliberalism, meaning essentially finance capitalism, uh, not uh, industrial capitalism. Uh, and that uh, absolutely uh, transformed uh, matters. The question is, what do other countries do to, uh, to stop this uh, uh, neoliberal policy that is destroying their economies? And uh, how do you stop uh, the U.S. military spending that's being used to essentially force you into budget deficits? We, the United States, beat Russia by uh, build our military buildup, and our military spending forced Russia to uh, spend so much to defend itself in the Cold War that uh, it couldn't produce consumer goods, and this led to the fall of uh, uh, Stalinism in the United States. The problem is, how do you uh, prevent uh, the U.S. from threatening you militarily and forcing you to divert your economy away from your own industrialization to uh, pay for uh, uh, your own military spending, which is a kind of overhead? Well, the United States uh, can do this and keep on spending uh, dollars without limit uh, because other countries uh, have to accept them, uh, and uh, that's uh, their form of savings, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, so that's led uh, China, Russia, and other countries to say, we don't want to be in the position that Iran was in in 1978. We, we, have, to we have to break free of uh, the dollar area. We have to de-dollarize. De de uh, obviously, every country needs to trade or do business with uh, countries using the U.S. dollars because that's uh, the system that has been created and is already in place. So China needs to hold heavy dollar reserves. Russia needs to hold dollar reserves. But the first thing they realize is we need an alternative. Uh, and the alternative is uh, obviously uh, gold. 
Russia is using its uh, trade and uh, investment surplus to buy gold. There's a difference between de-dollarization, actually avoiding the dollar, making your currency a reserve currency. De-dollarization is looking for an alternative. Uh, when I think when uh, China and other countries are and Russia are talking about de-dollarization, in the first instance, what they're talking about is avoiding the use of the dollar for foreign trade. What do you do? You, de- you never ever borrow money in a foreign currency. You only borrow in your own currency. You never denominate uh, your imports and exports in investment in dollars. Because if you invest, if you uh, make trade agreements in dollars, the United States is already threatened. Uh, we can uh, unplug you from the uh, the SWIFT, the uh, interbanking uh, computer system, and we'll pull the plug on your electronic uh, bank transfer system, and you won't be able to uh, operate your financial system. It's like turning off the lights. This is America's asymmetrical warfare. Uh, but if you denominate your uh, trade, investment, tourism in your own currency, and your debt in your own currency, then uh, if, you're, if the IMF tries to uh, uh, mobilize an economic raid on your currency and push it down, uh, where you'd have to pay more and more and more of your currency to raise the dollars, to pay the dollar debts, you're immune from this. You can simply uh, always pay your debts in the currency that you print yourself, whether it's uh, RMB or uh, Hong Kong dollars or uh, any other currency. So uh, the first step is to avoiding the use of the dollar, but uh, to uh, make your country a reserve currency, you'd have to do what the United States did. It made its dollar a reserve currency by running the balance of payments deficits that I talked about. It was a deficit that pumped the dollars into the world's central banking system that enabled the central banks to hold dollars in their foreign reserves, and that's what being a reserve currency is. Uh, I don't see uh, much opportunity for China to or Russia to run a balance of payments deficit right now. Uh, they're accumulating dollars, and so if the RMB or the ruble as global reserve currency, how are other people going to get uh, the RMB or the rubles if uh, you're not spending it, if you're not uh, importing from them by running a trade deficit with them, if you're not investing with them and having a uh, investment outflow, buying control of their resources, or spending uh, tourism money or military money there. I don't see any way of that happening uh, in the short term. So all that you can do to de-dollarize in the uh, short term is to cut your uh, currency independent of the U.S. economy. Fortunately, you have one man who's uh, helping you, who's doing more than either I'm doing or any uh, left-winger I know, and that's Donald Trump. He is realizes that other countries hesitate to uh, break away from the U.S. dollar, that they hesitate to, you need a critical mass of countries to accept each other's currency, for China to accept Russia's rules, Russia to accept uh, RMB, uh, Iran, uh, Turkey, other countries to do it. And so uh, Donald Trump has uh, made clear that uh, the United States has to be the winner uh, and other countries the loser in any trade agreement or financial agreement that's made. So it's helping drive driving Russia uh, into uh, the Chinese uh, uh, and uh, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Trump is also making it clear that we have no intention of ever repaying any of the dollars that uh, we other central banks have. And if we don't like a country that holds these dollars, we can simply cancel their accounts at the Treasury. You can have a bank account, and if someone, the bank president says, we've just erased your account. I'll give you a full heart. Now you can't pay your rent with it because I don't like you. That's what America can do to foreign countries of the Treasury, like it did with Iran in 1978. Uh, Trump has made clear that uh, that's one of his options. And uh, so he's saying you'd better get your act together and uh, become independent of uh, the U.S. dollar because here's what, if I don't do it, uh, the deep state behind me who run the CIA, the State Department, the Treasury, uh, they're going to do it to you. He wrote a a book explaining the whole policy. Uh, The book was called The Art of Breaking the Deal. And uh, that's how Trump 
made his money. He was the biggest real estate crook in uh, New York. And if you travel to New York, strike up a conversation with either a cab driver, anyone you'll meet, you'll meet somebody who's had some economic relations with Trump. And Trump's business plan is quite simple. If he, may, uh, uh, he makes a deal with uh, someone, uh, a contractor, to supply bricks, uh, he'll pay you 10% down, you know, do it. Then the contractor will say, I'm finished. Here's the money. Trump will say, well, I'll only pay you 50%. I don't like the bricks. Uh, there's one person I know from Pennsylvania who sold him 30 Steinway pianos. Then he asked for payment. Trump said, well, I really didn't. One of them was out of tune. I'm not going to pay you anything. You have to sue me. In the United States, it takes five years and at least $50,000 to bring any lawsuit. And the courts are uh, very well there about it. It's hell to try to sue Donald Trump. Hard, not many people have, uh, have collected. Uh, I gave an archaeology talk, and uh, uh, at one t uh, a man came up to me and said he was an architect, and actually the architect for the bathrooms in Trump Tower. And uh, he designed the bathrooms. Uh, they... Uh, made the tower. He said they built them very shoddily. Uh, and then he sent the bill and Trump said, well, we don't like the design. Uh, we're, not, we're not going to pay you. And the, uh, so the architect uh, found out that in under New York law, the architect has to sign off with the building department uh, that yes, uh, the uh, building's been done. And uh, he didn't sign off and Trump was threatened on uh, losing uh, $200 million and going bankrupt. He was the only person that I know who got the bill paid. Uh, 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 but uh, Trump also stiffed the banks that financed him, uh, and uh, nobody will deal with him except Russian kleptocrats and money launderers, which is, he found that he could make a whole, whole real estate business, not in selling to renters. You know, here if you have a developer and you're looking for an apartment buyer or an investor to buy your apartment, Trump looked for a foreigner with extra dollars if they wanted to hide and get out of their country in a hurry. And most of these apartments were essentially not for, not for living, not for using. They were uh, a way that money launderers and kleptocrats could uh, save their money. You know the joke about uh, people in America buy 100-year-old wine, or uh, rare wine, uh, a kind of trophy to collect. And uh, someone paid $5,000 for uh, a big bottle of uh, Richburg wine. And uh, they actually tried to celebrate and uh, have a party and poured it all out. And, uh, being 50 years old, or I think it was even 75 years old, it was turned to vinegar. And uh, the buyer complained to the uh, auction house and said, this wine's turned to vinegar. And the auction tells them, that wine's not for drinking, that's for trading. Well, that's what Trump's apartments are for. They're not for living in, they're for basically trading. And uh, uh, he uh, became a... Uh, television celebrity and was elected president because uh, uh, the Democrats under Hillary said this election is over who is the lesser evil. And the Americans made, I think, the right choice. Uh, Trump was the lesser evil. The alternative was World War III. Of course it was the lesser evil. That uh, We're still living in the aftermath of that. So essentially you have Donald Trump trying to conduct American foreign policy, its economic policy, its monetary policy, and military policy of we win, you lose, uh, unless you de-dollarize. Uh, and uh, I tried to make that uh, point. And, uh, uh, with uh, all these books, uh, a lot of people read them, but uh, I, I couldn't come near to what Donald Trump was able to do. So I, I'm sure that I've moved very fast, and I think now we should probably uh, uh, take some discussion and I can explain anything that I've left out as to what the world need, what you need to do. There's no way that people uh, can trust that. Already uh, attempts to make a Bitcoin have been subject to massive theft, uh, massive destruction. The hope in uh, issuing your own currency is that people who hold your currency will forget it, they will die, they'll, they'll write down their secret number someplace and then they'll die like a African dictators did or like W.C. Fields uh, used to do. He had bank accounts all over, and uh, but then he died and nobody knew how to get their money out and the banks got to keep the money. So uh, that's the hope of uh, Facebook and I don't think anybody, uh, there's no virtue in it. Uh, it's too risky and it's inherently suspicious. Uh, uh, I think it's a no-go. <laughs> Well, what does replace the dollar mean? There are 
two ways to replace the dollar. One is for your own economy. You can replace the people paying dollars to each other. You can replace China uh, paying uh, dollars to Russia or to uh, Iran or Turkey, minimizing the use of the dollar uh, for trade with non-dollar countries. Nobody's going to replace the dollar and ever achieve that kind of domination again, because that domination is predatory. It's uh, we win, you lose. And uh, I think uh, no other country, again, is ever going to let any other country, whether it's China or uh, Russia or uh, Saudi Arabia, ever uh, have the power to uh, threaten to tear, tear up their economic growth and impose austerity. So uh, let's hope that nobody tries to replace the dollar as an exploitation instrument again. First of all, all a SWIFT system is, a bank clearing system, is a computer program. Uh, I'm sure that other countries, and I'm told uh, Russia has already uh, been testing a, uh, its version of the SWIFT system and has already uh, test run it and says that they're willing to make the change over at any point so the United States is not able to threaten it by pressing a computer key. So that's already in the process of development as basic defensive strategy. Uh, of course, there will still be a role in the dollar because the dollar is a large economy and it has a lot of allies uh, and a lot of satellites like Canada, uh, like uh, England uh, uh, and Europe almost instinctively. They've spent so many centuries worshipping the aristocracy that they think uh, somehow the American uh, government is like the old aristocrats that uh, tell them what to do. So yes, there will always be a dollar area, but there will also be other countries having their own areas and uh, you'll have uh, currency blocks uh, moving uh, against each other. And uh, uh, the block, it won't simply be uh, the Chinese yen area. It'll be uh, like the euro area. It'll be a group of countries uh, working with China. And countries may have dollars uh, for trade with the U.S. and uh, Chinese currency and uh, euros to some extent. Uh, the problem with the euro is how are other countries going to get euros? The euro is a disastrous suicidal currency. Under uh, European law, uh, countries cannot run a budget deficit of more than 3% of their GDP. Now, if they can't run a deficit, how are they going to get euros into foreign countries? There's no supply of euros. There's not even enough supply to keep their own labor employed. Yeah, if you look at uh, what's happening in France, there's a, a long uh, general strike in France. Uh, all throughout Europe, the economies are shrinking because of this austerity policy. So uh, the euro is uh, a fictitious currency on the way towards uh, financial suicide. So I think you can pretty much ignore uh, the euro until uh, it breaks free of the United States. And uh, I've been told by U.S. Treasury officials uh, that that can never happen because the European uh, politicians are so corrupt uh, that all the Americans have to do is buy them off and uh, that they are uh, more easily buyable than uh, even third world countries. And uh, I've talk, talked to the officials in charge of this. Uh, they, they assure me that there is no way Europe will ever be independent of the United States. So I really don't. I, I think it'll be between the Chinese area and the dollar area is the main area. It's absolutely crazy. It's a, a forcing flow out of uh, the European currency into anything else. Uh, good news for Russia, uh, because uh, the Russian stock market is booming now because the Europeans don't want to lose money in the bank. And they look at the Russian market as uh, the big growth industry now that uh, Donald Trump has helped uh, them by uh, saying, look, we're not only declaring war on China, we're declaring war on you too, auto exports and everything. So Donald Trump is helping drive uh, the Eurozone into uh, the Russia-Chinese uh, uh, orbit. The only reason there are negative interest rates are to support the stock and bond market. Uh, all this money that they're creating to push into the financial markets could be spent in the economy to uh, employ people, to make means of production, to make new factories, to clean up the environment, to spend on infrastructure. It's only spent on increasing the stock and bond and real estate of the 10%. And that's a crazy system. And it's about uh, junk economics and financialization. Uh, the United States economy and the European economies have reached their financial limit. 
they cannot grow anymore because of debt deflation. And I describe why in uh, Killing the Host. The Americans and the Europeans owe so much uh, money to the banks every month for their, the cost of housing, for their mortgage debt, for their uh, automobile debt, for their education debt, for their medical debt, that there, uh, there is no money left to uh, spend on goods and services. Uh, Wall Street knows that the game is over. The game ended in 2008. It has not begun again, and it cannot begin again, as long as the debts are kept on the book. Every other country, when there was a crash, would not only wipe out the debts, but they'd wipe out the savings. What uh, President Obama promised to do was to write down the crooked loans of the banks that were uh, the junk mortgages. Imagine in Hong Kong that you would buy an apartment, you would borrow $400,000 from the bank, to buy an apartment for 200000 and uh, the bank would lend it to you and then sell the mortgage to some German local savings bank. They're the typical suckers uh, in all of this. <laughs> Basically, the whole uh, run-up to 2008 was bank fraud. Bill Black, my colleague at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, has described uh, uh, this. He was the prosecutor uh, and regulator in the savings and loan crisis. President Obama said, uh, if loans are made beyond the ability, mortgage order to pay, we'll write down the mortgage to the realistic value and the carrying charge will be whatever the normal rent would be. That's normally w- uh, what would happen. Uh, instead, he expropriated 10 million American families. He did not uh, throw a single banker in jail. Two days ago, the head of the Federal Reserve in the United States said, well, he should have thrown the crooks in jail. Instead, he put the crooks in charge of the government, in charge of the Treasury. They are in charge of every political party. The bank crooks are now running the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. They are the people that are on the media uh, for give it, give the good advice. Uh, the um, American economy has turned into a kleptocracy. Now, I remember back in the 1970s uh, and 60s, people were talking about, will the Soviet and the American economies converge? Uh, and there were many people that thought, yes, they will converge, like the discussion before World War I. America is going to be a larger and larger role for the government. Well, instead, uh, there has been a convergence, but it's a, a convergence of kleptocrats uh, in Russia and kleptocrats uh, in the United States, uh, trying to uh, convince other countries that... Uh, uh, to join them in uh, in uh, kleptocracy. There, uh, but all this is left. There's no money. Uh, the consumers don't have enough money after they pay the debt to buy goods and services. So there's no way that uh, the central banks can reinflate. Since 2008, we've actually had the largest inflation in American and Asian and European history. The inflation has all been in the stock market and the bond market. We've had the greatest bond market in history because the the, uh, the central banks say our job is to protect the commercial banks and to prevent uh, the uh, bondholders of the commercial banks from losing any money. Uh, Sheila Baer, who was the head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in the United States uh, under the Obama administration, tried to uh, uh, close down Citibank. She said, it's not only incompetent, it's corrupt. She tried to close them down, and Obama said, that's my com- campaign contributor. We can't do that. And Sheila Bear wrote, she learned it's all about the bondholders. And uh, the bondhold, you have 1% of uh, Americans owning uh, something like uh, 40% of the bonds and stocks, and 10% of Americans only owning 75%. So the job of the central banks has been to protect the stockholders and the bondholders at the expense of the Americans who own mortgages, uh, student debt, uh, and that's why there's no way of uh, inflating. So the Federal Reserve has created $4.6 trillion to give to Wall Street to spend on stocks and bonds, only a fraction, maybe $20 million for the whole U.S. general economy. Running a budget deficit in the United States has been to benefit only the wealthiest 5%. The entire growth of U.S. GDP since 2008 has occurred to only 5% of the population. That means for the remaining 95%, GDP has gone down. 
and their spendable income has gone down. I have online, and I think Ken Chi Lao has translated uh, the charts that I uh, presented in Germany last month, uh, tracing uh, all of this. European and American economies are in a debt deflation. In a debt deflation, you cannot uh, reinflate. There's going to be a steady, steady deflation, and the economy will shrink and shrink. And you can simply look at Greece to see what happens, or Latvia, or countries that uh, suffer debts to see the kind of problem that re uh, result from all of this. Well, uh, the basic principle of economics as in biological nature is negentropy. What you think of as the economy is really two systems. You have what's called the real economy of production and consumption uh, and government. And then you have the financial economy. Already in Babylonia, they had an, their economic models were superior to any economic model used in the Federal Reserve or banks today. What they realized in Babylonia was there is no entropy in compound interest. Uh, as Marx pointed out in volume three of Capital, uh, financial uh, interest-bearing debt grows by purely mathematical laws. They increase uh, the economy grows in an S-curve. And we have the Babylonian documents for the growth of a herd and how the real economy, the agricultural economy grows. People thought for a long time these were merely statistics, but then it turned out they were actually mathematical models of how the economy grows in an S-curve, but the debts grow exponentially. And at a certain point, the debts exceed the economy's ability to pay. Now, uh, Recognizing that fact that every economy tends towards disequilibrium, not entropy, but a disequilibrium, a, a crash. Uh, these are very good points. Ten years ago, when I was lecturing at Peking University, I was very impressed by the students there. The spirit they had, they felt they could really change the country. They really, there was a spirit of political activism, of getting, uh, looking forward to being in government uh, that I hadn't seen in America or Europe. And uh, uh, they said the first thing we have to do is clean up corruption. I think in order to clean up corruption, you have to really take control of the economy and that becomes what you're seeing in China today. The question is, can you cure corruption and still have a revolution for the people? There's something that I'm very surprised about when I've lectured at Peking University. I know that they, uh, I've usually lectured at uh, first and second Marxist forum. And uh, when they talk about Marx, they're talking about the Communist Manifesto. They're talking about volume one of capital and labor capital relations. What they're, what they're not talking about is what Marx talked about economically. I didn't hear any discussion of Marx's volume two and volume three of capital. And that's where Marx discussed rent and interest. Marx is an uh, optimist for capitalism, and we now know that he was uh, unduly optimistic. He thought that the task of industrial capitalism was going to be to free society from feudalism, from the carryover from feudalism, free society from landlords, get rid of the uh, land rent uh, and have that as the tax base, uh, get rid of the monopolies, and get rid of predatory finance, uh, and move towards what I described was the German system of uh, uh, a finance. Uh, it, it turned out uh, that didn't happen. When I went to Wuhan uh, 10 years ago, they were having their students read Samuelson, not Marx. When I was talked to my students at uh, Beijing, they say the students who study economics in America are given priority over students uh, that study economics uh, in China. In America, uh, if you get an economics degree, all you can do is teach other economists, because nobody's going to hire you because it's it's a parallel universe. It's science fiction. It's about a parallel universe and how the world would be if it were. It's actually taught as if it were a social science, uh, which is very funny. And uh, yet the Chinese send their students to uh, study this. I talk about it in my book, J is for Junk Economics, what they're taught there. The result is that, as you just said, there are all these millionaires in China. Is that Marxism? Well, I talked to one of my colleagues, uh, a, a Russian uh, professor at uh, Peking University, and he said that I should realize that Marxism is the Chinese word for politics. Suddenly I got it. I understood uh, what it meant and that it uh, wasn't about volume two and volume three. The last meeting there, I, I think last year, I had given the, the big speech in the first, uh, on the second Marxist meeting, they had my colleague, David Harvey, uh, say that, well, the most important thing you can do now that you're a country going Marxist is read volume three of Capital. 
uh, they did not applaud uh, <laughs> or seem to like it. I went to Tianjin University where I'd been lecturing off and on for maybe 10 years. And uh, they had a, uh, every uh, October, they have a class in fictitious capital. And uh, I had a student drive me from uh, Beijing to Tianjin and he was doing his thesis on what I'd written about fictitious capital. And they thought that uh, maybe I should come and address their conference. Well, uh, I then got a note from the professor who said, well, what they want to know is how can we get rich? And you get rich by screwing the cut, like Donald Trump got rich, by uh, making money at the other person's expense. And China has not tackled the problem of high real estate prices. And that's the big challenge. How do you avoid the uh, rise in real estate prices? Real estate is the largest asset in every economy. And uh, in real estate, the largest asset is land. Now, originally, Hong Kong had the idea that the natural tax was a land tax. And you don't want to tax your labor uh, for an income tax, because if you do that, uh, you have to pay labor enough money to pay the taxes in addition to, to living. But uh, land rent is a free, uh, a free ride. How, if you would tax away the land rent, then people would not have to go to the bank and borrow to pay more. And what's the house worth in Hong Kong or America? A, a, a home is worth however much a bank is going to lend you to buy it. And if you uh, don't want all of the rent to end up being paid to the bankers, it, who would become the new landlord class, replacing the old 19th century and feudal landlord, then you're going to want to avoid uh, the rent being paid to anyone except the uh, uh, public sector. That's something that, uh, that uh, I have not seen a discussion among uh, Chinese Marxists. I brought it up a number of times with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, I think in their, uh, they have an issue where they've uh, just published some of my ideas and we'll have another meeting next year in Greece. But uh, it's a problem still uh, only beginning to be addressed or thought about there. Almost every country these days, countries calling themselves socialist, are on the right wing of the political spectrum. In the, America, in the United States, the Democratic Party has moved way to the right of the Republican Party. Uh, they've, uh, they're supporting the CIA, the FBI against the president. Uh, in Europe, the German Social Democratic Party has fallen to about 8% of the vote. So the word socialism almost doesn't mean anything for as a political name, because I've been describing as the main political problem being financial. And financial, surprising as it is, has not turned out to be left or right. Most of the people I talk to are financial people, and uh, the right wing talks about finance. The left wing doesn't. The left wing talks about sexual identity, racism, anything except being a member of the working class. You have the Democratic Party breaking Americans into hyphenated Americans, Italian Americans, black Americans, sexual identity. The one kind of identity that they will not discuss is the identity of being a wage earner. And of course, that was, that's what makes uh, today's politics so different from what socialist politics was a century ago. The Chinese politics, there were so many accidental factors in that, beginning with assassination of uh, Mr. Liu in 1925, leading to the split between the Chinese Communist Party and the Kuomintang. The great tragedy for Chinese development was uh, the rise of Stalinism. The fifth common turn in 1927, and I knew many of the people there. When I grew up, uh, as it happened because of my family, few people who were members of the common turn under Lenin or who'd been to the Russians would all come by 10 or 11 years and tell me all of the stories so that somebody would remember them all. The big fight came in 1927 between Trotsky and uh, Stalin. Stalin urged the Communist Party of China to follow Chiang Kai-shek. Soon would urge the Communist Party of Germany to support Hitler and not to fight Hitler. When Hitler took power in Germany, the Communist Party had one million members under arms. Stalin said, don't do anything, go along with the, the election of Hitler. He paralyzed uh, the Communist Party deliberately because what Stalin realized was that the growth of communism in Germany or any other country but Russia would immediately shift the whole focus of communism away from Russia because it was Russia. 
So Stalin urged the Communist Party to back Chiang Kai-shek. Trotsky urged against this and said, no, you must not do that. Stalin soon expelled Trotsky and his supporters from the party. The Communist Party followed Stalin, and uh, we all know the result was the Shanghai Massacre. And at that time, a uh, few people knew that Chiang Kai-shek's loyalty was with the Green Gang whose leaders had been his uh, commanding officer in World War I in the decade earlier. Almost the entire Communist Party leadership, the intellectual leadership, was assassinated, leading Mao to sort of take what was left into the mountains and begin his long fight. The only way to replace a kleptocratic system is to put a system of rules laws in. I don't see that happening in Russia at all. You have one person, President Putin, essentially jawboning the other kleptocrat, saying you can make all the money you want, but you have to spend it on you know, projects that I believe will help Russia. That may work as long as Mr. Putin is in control, but what happens after him? I would like to see a system of law put in, and the Russian government and officials remain so neoliberalized so much taken over with ne American neoliberalism that I don't see their kleptocracy changing. China has a much better chance in moving against its kleptocracy, but in order to do it, it would have to prevent the emergence of a financial sector from dominating the economy. The ultimate kleptocratic exploitative feature in every economy for the last 5,000 years has been finance. That's why uh, David Graeber wrote his book, Debt the Last 5,000 Years. Without preventing economic rent, without preventing uh, the financialization of real estate, the financialization of industry, instead doing what Marx expected, the industrialization of finance and the industrialization and socialization of land rent monopolies and infrastructure, I don't see uh, kleptocracy being changed. And so what you have today is really a fight between two economic systems. A number of people in my discussions here talked about the Thucydides trap, which I think is a very naive way. The Thucydides trap is usually discussed in the media and the newspapers is, well, America's number one and it wants to prevent China from being number one or a rival. That's not what's happening at all. America doesn't want China to be number two or number three or number 27. It doesn't want anyone to be any other number at all. The Thucydides was writing his book about the Peloponnesian Wars between Athens and uh, Sparta. This was not a war for who would be number one. This was a clash of economic systems. It was a clash of Athenian democracy against Spartan support of oligarchies. Sparta supported oligarchies militarily to destroy and fight against any democratic country, which is why when it won the Peloponnesian War in 404 BC, it immediately installed a dictatorship of the 30, who immediately began to grab all of the property of the wealthiest Athenian Democrats who they killed, established a dictatorship. So the Peloponnesian War was against two economic systems. The fight of the world today is between neoliberalism, sponsored by the United States, and other countries trying to resume the kind of industrial promise that was promised by the classical economists of the 19th century, whom Marx was the final expression. Marx was the, form, was, uh, the formulation of classical political economy, of uh, the direction in which John Stuart Mill, and Adam Smith, all of these people uh, were moving. That's the real fight today. It's a, a clash of economic systems, not just number one or number two. Neo-feudalism is when industrial capitalism fails to liberate society from the landlords, hereditary ownership of the land, from banks and the land rent, from the unearned income, whether it's monopoly rent or land rent or financial interest charges, uh, siphoning off all the income of the economy for a class that doesn't produce. John Stuart Mill said that the landlord make, get, earns his rent and then gets the increase in land value in his sleep. In the United States, before 1913, when the Federal Reserve was created, the Treasury performed all of the functions that the Federal Reserve did. No country needs a central bank. The central bank, the purpose of the Federal Reserve was to take policymaking out of Washington, out of the Treasury. The Treasury officials were even removed from the Federal Reserve. 
President Roosevelt put them back in in the 1930s. I have articles on my website going over the history. What's the precondition for being a central banker? Number one, you don't understand money. Number two, you don't understand economics because you have to have an economics degree. And if you understand economics, you will drop out of it. the economics curriculum and do something like anthropology or art history or something uh, productive. In order to be a ruling class, you have to know what power is all about. And the idea of central banks is you don't know what power is about, but you know who pays your paycheck. There are many ways of declining. I mean, my way of solving the financial overgrowth is a debt cancellation. Because the good thing about canceling the debts is you're not only free consumer income for spending on things other than the banks, but you wipe out the savings. That's what you really want to do. Because as long as you have such a mass of savings, such that have grown all really since 1980, that's when all the charts turned around. You have to free society not only from the debts, but from the huge savings uh, that have become hereditary and uh, have become an overgrowth. We the past the 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 其实是为了国家稳定，啊，那当这种需要生息的政策在农村执行一段时间之后呢，往往会出现豪强大族占田，这个基层的不稳，啊，那不是基础不牢，地动山摇嘛，就会导致中央出现所谓中兴的政策，中兴的政策嘛，就是要一豪强一大族，啊，要防止更多的占田，你好，那这个做法呢，就会有很多所谓的斗争。甚至会出现，呃，清军策。So that gets back to the neo-feudalism point that you have. Instead of banking being industrialized and working to build up general prosperity, you've had industry being financialized. The question next to you was America winning, and that's a trick question because what is the America that's winning? America's winning the race to the bottom. The、uh, fight in America by the American、uh, industrial corporate class was. How do we win against labor? How do we lower the price of American labor while raising the price of our real estate, stocks, and bonds, and、uh, our assets? The way that they can lower the wages of labor is to deindustrialize. What do you do? You move to the lowest wage countries of all. Now, the ideal was to move to somewhere like maybe Haiti, where they spend their time sewing American baseballs. They're all sewed by hand in Haiti, but they agreed to move to China. And that was、uh, their idea of the race to the bottom. And then China had a clever idea. He said, "Okay, we'll let you hire our labor at a low price, but you have to show us the technology. How can you employ them without showing us how to make the capital goods and the infrastructure and the technology to employ them?" And all of a sudden, you had technology transfer. For American companies, that was winning. For Amazon, for Walmart. That was winning because they heaped down the price of American labor, and yet the result is you have a rust belt that they call the flyover land, and who Hillary called deplorables, who are the people. You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables, <laughs> right? President Obama called the mob with pitchforks. He called his voters the mob with pitchforks and said his job was to protect his campaign contributors from the mob with pitchforks who voted for him. And that was all on the White House. He wrote it all, thinking that would give them more campaign contributions, which indeed it did. So when you say winning, it always is going to resolve itself into the question: Will finance capital win, or will industry and labor? When、uh, living standards go up, or will there be a feudal class lording it over the rest of society? Every society, whether you're socialist or capitalist or or feudal or、uh, Babylonian, has faced that same、uh, problem. Yes, and in fact, I'm writing a sequel to forgive my Bronze Age economic history. I'm writing now. If you look at Greek and Roman economic history, Greek democracy was started by the debt cancellation of、uh, reformers of the seventh century. The opponents of reformers called them tyrant. The word tyrant. Didn't used to be a bad word. The word tyrant meant a reformer who was going to cancel the debts and redistribute the land. 
set the road toward democracy, which is what happened in Corinth. It happened in Sparta. Athens was about the last city to undertake this, uh, having had a very narrow mafiosi dictatorship. And Solon canceled the debts and started the Athenian democracy in uh, 594 BC. So you cannot have a democracy and have a lot of billionaires holding you in debt. That is the basic principle that if you want democracy, you cannot have people in debt peonage because that's feudalism and oligarchy. Now, Aristotle said that uh, many constitutions that people thought were democracy were really oligarchic. And he said there was an eternal triangle. And Plato agreed, democracies tend to develop into oligarchies when rich people take over and the oligarchies make themselves into hereditary aristocracies. And then a fighting occurs among the leading aristocrats to say who is going to dominate. And some aristocrats, as Aristotle said, take the people into their camp. And that's what Cleisthenes did in 507 BC in Athens, uh, led to the real political revolution of redefining the Athenian uh, voting rights and economic system on the basis of uh, geography instead of family uh, heritage. And uh, Servius did the same in Rome, 6th century BC. So in every country, uh, this has been the fight for democracy against oligarchy. You can't have democracy and oligarchy. You can't have an indebted population and 1% of the billionaires owning more than half of the wealth in the country, which is the, the Federal Reserve says is the case in the United States. I've been in Spain and visited best known worker cooperative in the Basque country. Worker cooperatives, for one thing, they don't like unionized labor. They like uh, cheap labor, especially they like to hire other people. And uh, how are you going to have a worker cooperative in the uh, oil industry that's very capital intensive? You'll have maybe five workers and a uh, hundred million dollars worth of capital. How are you going to operate that? I'm all for cooperation, but uh, you have to restructure the system. Cooperatives work within the existing financialized structure of the economy, and the structure has to be changed. Cooperatives don't change the structure. They try to work within it. It's not enough. Engels wrote a socialism utopian and scientific. That may answer some of the questions about whether ideal cooperative communities really can solve the problems of civilization. In order to make economics moral again, you have to let people know that it doesn't have to be this way. The world doesn't have to operate the way it's operating now. You have a choice. Now, the United States and uh, the neoliberals follow Margaret Thatcher. There is no alternative. If there really is no alternative, then what's the point of morality? You take morality out of it because there's no alternative. It's all scientifically proved mathematically that uh, the world can't be any different than it is because this is the result of natural selection. And if another country would be better, be living like Chinese. Uh, it's necessary to outline how an economy would work without a financial sector and tax system the way it is. Well, that's what 19th century classical economics was all about. They were reformers. They were not supporting the status quo. All of the reform movements and the leaders from Greece and Rome all the way to the modern times, they all seem to come from the upper class who said, this is a hell of a way to make money. And I've known a lot of multimillionaires in Wall Street. And they say, you know, I really hate making money this way because it's just so unproductive and exploitative. You know, I wish the world were different. And David Ricardo was a lobbyist stuff for the bankers. And even he said, you know, shouldn't the world be different? So yes, it would be nice if some of the exploited people would say the world should be more moral and different instead of just the exploiters saying, boy, it's really unfair that I make money this way. Can't there
，富者越富，强者越强。而二十世纪现代民主的乌托邦理念，产生了最辉煌的意义。对于这个世界的结构性的不合理，人们一方面不认为强权所确立的秩序是无可更改的，同时人们不相信从来如此。就将永远如此，就是人们不再相信说那些写在纸上的东西永远只在纸上。如果说人生而平等，我们要使这个平等变为现实。那么，在今天这样一个资本主义全球化已经达到了前所未有的高度和深度的时刻，我们的问题已经不仅是资本主义会终结吗？我们的问题变成了。终结资本主义之后，人类社会向何处去？人类社会将怎样？资本主义之外的生命的、人类的社会的可能性究竟是什么？同时，我们深切的警惕着，我们深切的忧虑着，究竟是人类终将终结资本主义，还是资本主义在自我终结之前先终结人类？资本主义的危机是如此的深重，而我们在整个这样的一个资本主义所建构的社会形态之中的卷入又是如此之深，那么我们的可能在哪？所以对于我来说，我介入相见运动起源于刘建之老师最早向我展示的这样的一种寻找 alternative， 寻找另类，寻找另类的可能性，寻找其他的出路，而后。刘健老师带着我和温铁军老师所介入的这样的一个反全球化的世界的运动现场，我们共同认可了一个口号，叫做 “Another world is possible”， 另一个世界是可能的。而我非常记得当年我们在墨西哥的一个很破旧的哈小的旅馆房间当中促膝请谈的时候，温老师曾经尝试把 “Another world is possible” 翻译为“打造方舟”。所谓打造方舟，意味着我们警惕大洪水的到来，意味着我们在大洪水到来之前，也是资本主义自我终结的时候可能引发的灾难到来之前做出准备，以便人类，尤其是底层的民众，可能在这场灾难中逃离。我经常喜欢在讲电影《泰坦尼克》的时候，我说在那样的一个好莱坞电影当中，当巨型的游轮在滨海当中沉没的时候，三等舱先进水。当三等舱已经淹没在洪水之下的时候，头等舱的顾客还在优雅地拉着小提琴，从容地告别。那么，我们寻找 another world， 我们呼唤打造方舟，是为了三等舱的人，在滨海沉船之际，在大洪水到来之际，在资本主义制造的灾难迸发之际，可能获救，可能逃离。Perhaps we need to stop seeing to the top. And try to see around us at the grand roots. Perhaps we can find there the source of inspiration that we badly need for these confusing times. We are all little butterflies. We act and constantly, every moment, in every way, in on every issue, we 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 push in one direction or another. And we no way of counting all that, but at some point it'll tilt one way or the other, and then we'll be in a new system, which will either be a hell of a lot worse, or at least not as bad, and one that will be significantly better. So go ye forth and be butterflies. I'm not a butterfly. I'm just a ordinary person. I'm just a member of the whole team. 我们叫做大象无形，大音希声，立于中道，必非家常也，而从之者众。有一大批人，也就是说，我们无论在这个社会上的哪个角落，我们在做着什么样有益于社会进步的事情。我们一来主张，世界是我们的，做事靠大家来，不但做身边的任何一件小事。所以，勿以善小而不为，勿以恶小而为之。我们一直是这样主张的。我们也主张大家的努力集合在一起，就是上善若水，水善万物而不争，最终呢，止于至善。